we're going to shift now into the question and answer session. Um, for the participants, uh, if you have questions, please continue to type them into the Q&A chat box. Um, but there are a few questions already in. Um, firstly, I would like to pose a question to Dr. Ravi. Um, when it comes to the management, uh, pharmacological management for frontotemporal dementia uh, versus Alzheimer's dementia, um, would you just like to share some uh, clinical sort of tips on this? Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Dr. Vina. That's actually a very good question. Because though we uh, understand that we can use same type of medication for all dementia syndrome, Usually, uh, unlike Alzheimer's dementia, frontotemporal dementia has a slightly different uh, pathophysiology. The cholinergic reserves are actually well preserved in frontotemporal dementia. So, using cholinergic drugs to treat uh, symptoms, initial symptoms of uh, uh, dementia, basically sometimes what happens that they have a psychotropic effect and uh, it results into worsening of uh, confusion, even hallucination and sometimes psychosis also. So. Uh, the usual cholinergic drugs like um, our galantamine, rivastigmine, mm -hmm. and donopezil, uh, we have to use with caution. Instead of that, if let's say when we start a small dose of donopezil with a FTD patient, because sometimes what happens that we think that it's Alzheimer's dementia, but later on it actually turns out to be FTD. So when we try a small dose of donopezil, then we see that their confusion, their psychosis is getting worse. So we have to stop that medicine and we have to try sometimes atypical antipsychotics like cutiapine, a small dose. That can actually uh, you know, improve the symptom because the main problem, main symptoms in FTD is usually behavioral issues yes. rather than amnestic yes. episode. So I think that is the, the main thing with FTD. So the physician has to be a little bit caution, cautious to use uh, cholinergic drugs in FTD. While Alzheimer's or uh, Alzheimer's spectrum disease, yes, we can use those cholinergic drugs easily. Yeah. Sure. Okay. As an adjunctive question to that, I mean, would that be a situation where maybe uh, some form of imaging may have been useful at the start? Yeah, so as I said that the reaching to a correct diagnosis is very important. So a careful history with a, a clinical diagnosis because we have to see whether patient has more amnestic or like executive dysfunction or whether more behavior. Mm -hmm. When we have some kind of clinical syndrome or clinical dementia syndrome, then the confirmation by using uh, imaging like MRI scan or FDG PET if that also doesn't. So FDG PET when you do you can see hypermetabolism in the topographical manner you know whether like in Alzheimer's usually is temporoparietal mostly but in FTD as the name suggests is more frontotemporal. Mm -hmm. So when we see this kind of differentiation it's easy to differentiate these dementia syndromes early and then we can use our medications early. However we have more biomarkers and in fact uh, like Dr. Santosh mentioned that you know the imaging studies more imaging studies coming which actually can help us to diagnose and also to follow up these patients, you know, early. So instead of labeling them and then using that, try to actually uh, keep our options open, even get more history from the family members and follow up, see there are new, new features coming or not. That is the most important thing. I think. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, okay, there's a question here on, I think this is for Dr. Santosh. What's the added value of AI imaging as opposed to diagnosing and following up on Alzheimer's dementia through clinical history and serial cognitive testing. Okay, so I think uh, this is where the uh, the uh, the papers do show, like in the Remember study as well, is uh, that we are increasing diagnostic certainty. So in some cases where you might actually have to do cognitive uh, serial testing with the biomarker information available, you might be actually able to make a diagnosis earlier because as we know that on the chart where we look at the different markers of disease, if a patient is symptomatic and probably in this case where the cognitive test is probably abnormal or marginally abnormal and with the additional biomarker information showing you that there's already hippocampal atrophy for instance going on, then you know that the likelihood of neurogenic disease causing the dementia symptoms is high and then you would escalate the patient for the necessary and relevant care. Can I just ask in relation to that, the, mm -hmm. you shared the slide um, from one of the European studies where mm -hmm. many of the referrals for this imaging are coming from specialists. Yes. What's your experience here so far? Uh, I think experience here so far has been uh, limited but I think the majority of the cases that I have are actually from uh, specialists okay. and uh, the study is actually, I, volumetry I think is, is still quite new in, in Singapore. Um, 
I've been working in bringing into the market really for the last two years. Uh, it's more widely established, for instance, in, in the United States, where it's been there for the last 10 years. Uh, recently, I think quite significant market that has adopted this was actually in Australia. Um, but really, it's um, a test that I think is growing, and I can see that the referrals are actually increasing. That means as mm -hmm. people get to use it more, they understand its value, and I think what actually happens is, is that you're able to have a better pickup. That means in patients that you would probably tend to follow up, you might actually want to escalate them to the next level. That means maybe it might even push you to maybe do further tests, maybe even do further FDG PET. So your, your diagnosis of the patient will actually be pushed forward. And this is what really the aim is of this entire thing, making the diagnosis early because early intervention and outcomes are always better. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Kwa, there's a question I think it would be appropriate for you. How can we kickstart meaningful conversations with a patient who may be in denial in the early stages of dementia and would societal conversations um, on preventive prevention of dementia be useful? So it is, uh, prevention is what we always emphasize in the medical school. So, um, and uh, so although the paper was published in Lancet for, for the, the uh, sample was 70 or 68 years old, the, uh, the, the Lancet editor said that is too old to start prevention. So the, the trust of the research now is for people who are 40, 40 and above uh, to do prevention. So how to start up a conversation with someone uh, um, uh, with dementia or early dementia? You know? So often I've said it must, in terms of having good respect for this person, you know? and and I often start if, even for the doctors, it's often difficult to break bad news to the doctors, you know? and they are they are petrified. You know? So I will I will tell them that if, if sir, you have a memory problem, you know. You know? And they're about telling you many things you can do to improve your memory. You know? And uh, and maybe the second or third visits, then we'll tell them about, well, uh, it looks like this is Alzheimer's disease. This is very important because they will have to draw up something like the will or lasting a power of attorney. Or if you do it too late, then you're in dire straits uh, later on in terms of management. Uh, they will not want to agree with all the, the legal issues involved. So very early, I'll tell them that, well, you may have to get a lawyer to, to help out to draw up uh, your, your lasting power of attorney. And, and also to build up the relationship with the person, you know, the, so the, the doctor-patient relationship, the confidence you have, a good rapport. You know, um, so consistently the same person uh, to see. And give them time. Sometimes we rush. You know, you, you go to the, the, the uh, clinic, sometimes this little time, you know, uh, only about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, but I think uh, uh, we should improve on it and say maybe take a longer period of time. And sometimes for the family caregivers also, we have, we have a, 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 a group practice or group therapy with them to see how we can help out in terms of communication. Certainly communication with patients with dementia is an area that we should be doing more research, how we can talk to them. Uh, um, some, some of them have hearing problems and visual problems and cues and all that. So we have to respect them first as a person. Sometimes, for example, in the ward round, the, the, big, the doctors will say, Bait 35, a patient with dementia, and then walk quickly. You know. well, Bait 35 is, could be Tan Akao or Alice or someone who has got a name. So you must think about it is the centra centrality of personhood. It's a person that we must respect you know, rather than a disease. Yes, he may have a dementia, but his dementia is his illness, but he's a person. You respect the person, he gets on well with you, they'll be fine you know, in terms of communications. I think one of the challenges is, I think, the um, uh, notion that memory problems are just part and parcel of aging. That's right. That's uh, right. And therefore, that's nothing right. needs to be done or can be done that's about right. it, right? I think, Dr. Ravi, is your experience similar? Yeah, I, I agree with yeah. both of you, actually. Yeah. yeah. But the point you mentioned earlier about depression, so very often in the early phase of dementia, they also have symptoms of depression. Mm. And I've looked up, looked up after two doctors who were diagnosed with depression, but the family was not too happy, and they, and they sent the, the, the doctors to me. In fact, they have a, a, de a dementia, but because they know they have something coming up, they're a bit worried and very depressed about the whole thing. So it's, it's, uh, it could be a combination of both, of an underlying uh, dementia 
super important on it is the, uh, the depression itself. So we've got to treat the depression also. Yeah, I actually agree with Prof. Kola. There was a patient, I just remember that uh, everybody, he saw two or three uh, neurologists and the diagnosis of dementia was made. Um, he came from overseas and then when I saw him, we took a history and we found that uh, because of recent grief in family, uh, he was last six months you know, under severe depression and not talking and not responding to people. He couldn't do work properly, so he was like, you know, has to resign also from the work. So basically all these aspects everybody kind of like ignored or he didn't open up. When the treatment for depression was started, actually we saw that he's showing signs of improvement and then the label of dementia was off from him. So definitely the careful history taking is very important. Yeah. That's right. Um, now, in relation to that, um, Professor Kwad, another question for you here. For art and dementia, are there specific things we need to do with patients for this, like reminiscence, or do we just ask them to go to the National Gallery? I, I think what maybe this person may be asking is, uh, are there specialized services That's right. uh, mm -hmm. where you know someone can go yes. to? Good and how question. can families yeah. assist? Yeah. Uh, art, and, art and music are the popular ones, you know, All right? I, I will talk about art first um, and as I mentioned when we did the study the, the, the art itself and the reminiscence of, of Chinatown in the 1960s or, or Singapore in the 1940s and all that brings back a lot of interesting memories in them and there's something for them to talk about because often when you see a person with dementia they come to the clinic you know, sometimes there's nothing to talk about you know? so, but in the group itself they will exchange ideas. We have a group of four people with uh, dementia and then they discuss, oh yes, I remember Chinatown those days, what did I buy in China, Chinese New Year, you know. So very interesting, they're able to maintain a conversation or else they sit at home and they're almost mute. You know? And that's, that it began to regress. You know? So the music part was actually the idea came out from uh, looking after one of our surgeons. Uh, he, he the, the wife, Whenever you diagnose someone with dementia, this surgeon, uh, the, the teacher in the university, lots of his students, doctors came to visit him. But then, um, after six months, the number of visitors stopped. You know. So the wife was very lonely and there were no kids. You know. So um, he, she, she rang me one day and said, my, my, hus my, um, my husband is very restless at night and evening. So I was... Uh, was uh, uh, seeing a patient in the neighborhood, so I told her I'll drop over your, your, your flat to see him. So I went up to the flat and I looked at him, he was very quiet, he was lying on the couch, but the background was the music, the music of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. So I said, that's interesting. So I have a chat with him and I asked him, you seem to enjoy the Moonlight Sonata. You know? So what is it about this music? So it's a reminiscence. So he told me that, well, I will tell you that um, this music reminded me of London in the 1950s. He was the f probably the first Singaporean to be trained as a surgeon in London. He passed the FRCS and he told me that he was so happy he passed the exam. He, took, he went down to the city itself, bought a ticket at the Whitmore Hall and the person performing the concert was performing the Moonlight Sonata. So when he heard the music, he, he thought about London in the 1950s, it comes in down. So in our music reminiscence also about, about uh, songs that the, the seniors enjoy. So among the Chinese, it has to be a uh, Teresa thing, the moon represents my heart. The people say, oh, I remember this song, I was in primary school, whatever it is, so there's something to talk mm. about, you know, and then we join in together. I think this question, Dr. Ravi, maybe, um, what approach to better manage MCI patients moving through time to mild moderate dementia because right now screening and diagnosis tends to happen mainly at specialized dementia services in tertiary hospitals. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think this is a common question asked from many, uh, you know, patients also or the family members. Even before MCI, which is mild cognitive impairment, there's another stage which is subjective cognitive impairment. That means a patient feels because he's a high functioning. You know, uh, he feels that he's not that sharp. And that thing is actually gradually progressive as well. When we do all kind of screening tests, we found that, you know, he scored full. All his MMSE MOCA is full. So 
those kind of patients we label as subjective cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. And if they score a little bit less, then they goes into the criteria for MCI. Now, MCI or, or SCI or SCD, subjective cognitive impairment, I think uh, the first thing is that keep a close eye on them. Basically, follow them, you know, uh, with uh, some sort of either clinical or maybe an imaging tool. And as Dr. Santosh mentioned his talk about uh, volumetric scan, you know, hippocampal volumetric scan. Usually, what we do is that if they are very mild, early stages of dementia, we'll, we won't start pharmacological therapy yet for them, okay? It depends on what kind of features they exhibit, what are the problems they are facing, and what kind of quality of life they're having. Then we will actually follow up them with help of imaging. And in imaging, we can easily see that, yes, these are the volume of the, you know, let's say memory centers, and then we see some kind of shrinkage or some kind of atrophy there. Based on that and also on the features, then we introduce some kind of pharmacological therapy. Before that, I think, as I think in Prof's uh, uh, talk also, uh, new hobbies, even like music and painting, all those things also quite, you know, the artwork, that's also very important. But to me, when you start a new hobby, you kind of open new circuits in the brain. So basically, when you want to, when you don't want to go to that progressive stage, the best thing is that, listen, uh, go and see your physician, uh, get a pharmacological help if it's there. If not, then go for these kind of intervention. That means uh, uh, whether you get a good hobby, introduce yourself into, a, let's say, a reading or writing kind of habit and more discussions, you know. Those are the things which actually makes your circuits actually um, uh, more prominent and maybe a new neuronal circuits will develop. So I think there are multidisciplinary approaches, basically, and it all targeted to different population of the patient, not like one therapy for one patient. Mm -hmm. It depends on what kind of challenges he's facing. We have in a community now um, the Age Well Everyday Program, which is the first program in Asia on dementia prevention. The study meant for people with mild cognitive impairment. So this, this paper has been published. Uh, in fact, we've been asked to, to, to speak in the next World Congress, you know. And it's, it's good news for people. In fact, the, um, the chairman of Congress told me that, um, you know, in, in the recent meeting we had, that everyone talked about the pandemic, the, the depression, the suicide. Hey, there's good news from Singapore, you know. There's some, something they're doing that, uh, that can help to prevent dementia. We cannot prevent all dementia. If you can prevent 10%, 20%, that's wonderful, you know. I remember when I first talked about this, I was invited to give a lecture in Harvard, and I told the Harvard, it was in the Department of Neurology, and I told them there is a possibility, that was 15 years ago, that we can prevent dementia. They say it's, it can, but it's tough, it's difficult. You know? So Harvard people had come down here, John Groudon was chief of neurology, and he said, hey, this is something you people are doing, it's wonderful, we haven't done it in America yet. You know? And uh, you can just... Uh, prevent 10 percent. 10 percent means you save 250. That's excellent, you know. So I, I think it's good. Well, that we we are doing something, and it's in the community now. You have it in Queenstown. You know, there are eight centers in Singapore. The Indonesians and Malaysians are also very keen, and also the, from China, they ask us to help them out to organize something, something for prevention, the non-drug approach, which I think is, is wonderful. Yeah. Maybe just add on a little bit to that. So uh, just wanted to. Uh, you know, echo what Dr. Ravi has actually mentioned. So actually, the role of imaging uh, is really changed today. So it's not just to look at things like tumors, hemorrhages, and strokes. I mean, sometimes I think we are kind of concerned that, oh, our imaging is going to come back with essentially like a normal report, nothing significant. But today, with artificial intelligence assisted volumetry, we actually can pick up shrinkage, which is important biomarkers. And if a person is positive, then you always want to pay a closer attention to this patient and a patient who doesn't have the biomarkers, you probably might just follow along the usual clinical route. Can I add in to what Dr. Sandoz meant? I think we like to uh, complement what he does. He does the imaging. We also do the detailed neuropsychology assessment. So we reckon that before you change in the, uh, the structure, the, the soft signs of neuropsychology assessment can be seen. So it's good to uh, combine both together. Isn't yes. it? Okay, there is a question here on Eduham. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, are there head-to-head -head studies comparing Eduham versus uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors in early dementia? And what patients would benefit from Eduham compared to cholinesterase inhibitors given the potential, potential for worsen, worse side effect profile with Eduham? Yeah. So, uh, I think I'll just summarize this whole, whole Eduham that... Uh, uh, last year, um, after a few major trials, 
it was actually concluded that uh, this can be the first uh, breakthrough in dementia treatment. This can be the, you know, um, changing the whole world basically or, or people's perception about dementia. For so many years, we have uh, this issue that dementia, we can slow down the progression, but we cannot treat, we cannot reverse the thing. But this is the first disease modifying therapy, which FDA, uh, you know, approved. But um, I think still there are so much um, gaps or patches in, in the in the data and the study that um, we should not jump and say that yes, now dementia is treatable. First of all, it's only um, uh, approved in Alzheimer's type of dementia, that too in mild cognitive impairment or very early stage of dementia. Uh, Singapore, uh, so far we don't have in uh, Aduham here, but I think in coming months or year when we have more studies from European centers, then I think we'll be able to judge that yes, this is more safer or they are, the harmful effects are more. Because as I mentioned, that there is cerebral edema risk, there is gait disturbances risk. Mm -hmm. In patients who have recently had stroke, and let's say uh, uh, there is uh, more tendency of you know bleeding, then the chances of bleeding also more. And also other thing that sometimes Alzheimer's disease diagnosis is also not so certain. It looks like Alzheimer's spectrum, but later on turned to be something else. And in these kind of cases, uh, medication will cause more harm. So we have to wait for, I think, few more major trials by end of this year, most likely. And once one disease or modifying therapy is introduced, I'm sure there'll be more pharmaceutical companies will jump into it and there will be more drugs coming in future. That's why I said future is maybe full of hope for dementia patients, definitely. Is it already being used in Singapore? Uh, not yet. Eduhelm is not yet here. Okay. But uh, yeah, we are waiting for more data first. Yeah, Because still it's not so clear. That what, but it is something, you know, beginning. the starting is done already. Mm. Now we have to get just more data and then see whether the safety profile is okay or not. Okay. Uh, there's a question I'd just like to throw open to all three of you. Um, we all come across patients who may not even want to be investigated, let alone treated for cognitive uh, impairments, for dementia. How do you manage these patients in clinic and practice? As I mentioned, um, diagnosis is a very powerful diagnosis. The diagnosis of dementia is a very powerful diagnosis. And they want to be very careful of the consequence of it. Um, so, um, so working together, the family doctors are very important. You know, even for, for mental health issues, people with depression, schizophrenia. You know. So I ask that, or I often ask that the family doctor, maybe you just carry on the follow up. You know, you just do the ECAQ questionnaire and give me a, a, an idea, the score, and then after six months, try again and. And then, uh, um, and let us see later on when, when things are tipping over, the, the, the patient may want to come to conversation. But in the meanwhile, talk to them about what they can do for their diet, their, their mental stimulation at the same time. You know? So these are things that we help them out for to prevent them from getting, getting worse. You know? yeah. And uh, it's only that when they are very bad and the caregivers are all uh, uh, in, in, the, in, in dire straits that they want to ask for more help. But in early phase, is always this challenge. And I find it most difficult among the doctors. Doctors with dementia is very, very difficult. A lot of denial. And one even want to drive the car when it's not that well. And it's always difficult. It's only when we their, their, their confidence in you and they say that I think it's time to pass the, give the key to your son and then uh, carry on. Mm. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll add to that. Yeah. So I, I had a very interesting case, I think about a month or two ago. Um, the mother has two different diagnoses and from two different sides of the family. <laughs> One side of the family, the psychiatrist they were consulting had diagnosed the mother with dementia. The other side of the family with the same form of clinical assessment had diagnosed that the mother does not have dementia. Now, so this was causing a bit of tension because the mother was in the process of writing her will and there was all this uh, LPA things going on as well. So somehow or other, I mean, and, and she couldn't, they couldn't get her to at least be arranged for a PET scan, <laughs> all right? Uh, so somehow or other she came to, to me in terms of, uh, can we do something more with just MRI scans? And so, of course, when we did the volumetry for her, I mean, she, you know, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, she has at least one physician saying that she's got dementia from a diagnostic criteria point of view and the other one not. 
But the imaging actually showed that uh, she had all the typical biomarkers for, for dementia and actually particularly Alzheimer's disease. And so this information was then given back to the clinician and made known to the family. But subsequently, I don't know how that part of things turned out, but it's a place at least uh, where I've seen where you know volumetry or some form of imaging actually can help. And in this case where it was difficult to get her for PET, uh, that's how she ended up with me to do an, a volumetry scan for her. Yeah. So yeah, I think those patients who are in denial, as Prof says, or they don't want to, let's say, investigate much, I usually uh, discuss with uh, their family members, but their GPs play a very important role in their care, actually, because they are the one whom they are consulting since a long time. So I usually involve them in the in the uh, treatment for the patient. And uh, because they are seeing me for the first time or second time, so the trust is actually building. So usually what I tell them is basic uh, you know, features for Alzheimer's. And I always tell them that in case either dementia or Alzheimer's disease, whatever the diagnosis, it doesn't mean that it's end of the world. Basically, it's just that we have given you, there are features suggestive of that. And if we diagnose this thing early by help of today's latest modality, as what Dr. Santos said, the imaging modalities are so uh, much better now. Once we have diagnosis, we can actually kind of start some early intervention, either pharmacology, non-pharmacological approach, and we try to prevent it from getting worse. And that's how he can plan his life better. And, you know, all these LPA or whatever his, you know, family um, uh, jobs or whatever things he has to plan, he can do it in a proper way. So basically, Basically, this kind of thing is giving, giving control of his own life to his own handler. Basically, this is the main thing which I tell my patients that do not afraid of dementia. We all know that uh, it's a usually progressive disease, but nowadays the things are changing. Interventions are, ch are, are changing. So basically, trust your doctors, your your in fact your GPs or your you know physicians, and then we all together can definitely do better for patients. But patients should be involved in the care also. Yeah. I think the good point what he mentioned by Dr. Ravi is, remember, dementia is not a terminal illness. It is a chronic illness. Mm -hmm. So I was interviewed uh, two months ago by the, the people at St. Luke Hospital. They're doing a video and, I, and they asked me, what happened if you have dementia? If I have dementia, obviously I'll, I'll tell my family members, I'll tell my friends uh, so that they know how to manage, you know. So I hope if I have dementia, uh, Dr. Santos will give me a ring and say, hey, are you still around? I see you are alive. I'm sure I can go for coffee together. So this life still goes on. It's not the end of the world, you know. There's the many things we can do. You know? oh, maybe I, have a, I actually have a question I want to throw out because I think uh, today we, we know that early detection is helpful. There's also pharmacotherapy. But also, you know, that the industry has gone into this as well, where people are creating applications for, you know, on your phone that you can use for CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, Prof. Kwa and Dr. Ravi, this is a question I, I throw out to both of you. Well, well, cognitive behavioral therapy is more for depression. Uh, but there are other techniques, you know, even for mindfulness. There's a, there's a website on, on uh, app on MindFi to help you, to, to teach you, you know. Now, the last few months, I'm seeing a couple of doctors who are almost burnt out now because of the pandemic. We call it pandemic fatigue, you know. Mm. And so they, are, they, say, they say, we don't want any drugs. So we, well, they try, you go look at the web, website for, for MindFi, M-I-N-D-F-I, they tell you what to do. But the MindFi also helpful for people with very early dementia. You know. Once you're able to concentrate well, they can focus well, then you can store it well. It's always the anxiety, the fear, you know. So people are forgetful, even normal people are forgetful because there's so much in your mind. You, know. no, you, you worry about this, you worry about that, you, you know. so you, you, you're, you're, you're distracted. You know. So if you're able to manage your, the, 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 your own mind well, then you finally can remember things better. Yeah, I think uh, mindfulness is definitely very important because many of my patients come with very high functioning, very, um, you know, intelligent people. But because of this mental clouding or doing multitask all the time, their mind is always like, you know, fatigued or tired. And pandemic actually like, you know, increases it to like 10 times. So I always tell them that, you know, um, after my assessment, if there's nothing wrong, that I tell them that the, the key is actually the mindfulness and all these apps which are actually available now. So follow these because this kind of information and this kind of intervention can actually um, try to eliminate that fear that, you know, I'm going to be like, you know, demented and all those things. So I think these things are very important, play a very important role. On the flip side, um, just to share, um, I have a patient now who comes to me every single month because she wants to have an MMSE done. 
because she's so worried she's going to get dementia. And she says, I need to know early because I've got things to do. Mm. So on the flip side, you have those, you know, who uh, actually she doesn't even have dementia. But she just keeps coming and she yeah. says, you see me two, three months, it's too long. You have to see me every month. And every month she will ask to repeat the test. So I suppose uh, for this case, uh, it's more anxiety, isn't it? Yes. And when they yes. see Dr. Vina, they, felt, they feel better. So the doctor is the best drug. You know, sometimes the doctor uh, relieves your anxiety, and, and, and Dr. Vina will smile at them, and they're okay, they feel better. Then they're not too well. The next month, they come back to you again. You know? Has she had an MRI scan already? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no. So that, yeah. one last question then before we close, because we're running out of time. Um, maybe I ask also Santosh. Um, you know, uh, as we. Uh, get better and better with uh, imaging modalities and you have the ability to pick up things early. The next thing that's going to come is screening. And uh, where would this fall into, you know, into that category? And yeah, so it's, uh, it's an interesting topic. It's a controversial topic. Um, so I think even in my presentation, you can see that the focus here is really on symptomatic patients and really places where we can make a clear benefit for the patient. Unfortunately, for those asymptomatic individuals, the benefit is not clear, all right? So we also know that there's something called congenital lower volumes of the hippocampus, which can also happen. So it does not mean that if your hippocampus volumes are low when you're asymptomatic, you are going to be getting uh, uh, dementia. The other thing is, low volume hippocampus is actually not the most accurate. The most accurate is actually still the rate of brain atrophy. And so... That may be something that uh, in a study, okay, uh, there's been an observational study, uh, I'll just share it here. So this is a patient that has a strong family history of a behavioral variant frontal temporal lobe dementia, uh, but uh, he does not have symptoms. He is only at the age of about 30, 40, but very close to the time point at which his predecessors became symptomatic. And he wanted to be on one of these new disease-modifying therapies uh, called LMTM. Uh, so in order to do this, they had to prove that he had some form of uh, disease. Mm -hmm. So they actually did a two time point scans to show that um, he did have an abnormal rate of brain atrophy. So his rate was not at 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 percent. He was close to 1 to 2 percent. Mm -hmm. And uh, so clinically asymptomatic, but was proven to have a rate of brain atrophy that was higher than expected and then was started on treatment. Now, this was a treatment, this is a whole thing that was done over 10 years, okay? So the first five years, that's what happened. In the next five years, after his treatment completed, then they showed that his rate of brain atrophy had reduced. Now, he never developed symptoms at the same age as his predecessor star did. But then, then the question here is, is that, is this the norm that we should do for every patient? You know, I think still we, are, we don't have any clarity on that. Um, there are all these things that you can pick up from the literature, from PubMed and things. People are doing observational studies here and there, but we still don't have an answer. So I would say screening is controversial. Uh, I think uh, we can be clear about the benefits in those patients that need it. Thank you. Now, we come to an end to our question and answer session. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you to our three speakers for that uh, wonderful discussion.